All right, now 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a lot going on here, um, but it's really one main subject, one main theme, and it's kind of going to, it's going to be similar to what I was preaching about this morning about the will of God. In a sense, you know, it's going to be very personal for you. Um, the Bible is giving us an, an, an overview of chapter 12. He's saying, you know, the church is like a body, right? And there's many members within the church, there's many members of a body, and the members of a body is talking about body parts, right? A body is composed of, you know, ears, nose, eyes, hands, feet, knees, elbow, I mean, all the different parts of our body, right? Hair, just, just so many different parts that make up completely and entirety our body. And basically what he's describing here, it's similar with the church, okay? There's lots of different members that have different uses and different functions. You have different skills. You have different abilities where you're, you know, God has created us differently. God has given us different gifts and different skills that, that we are able to do better than other people. But what he's trying to describe here, first of all, is saying, look, just because you're not the eye and you're the ear, you know, like you're no less valuable or, or, or you know, don't worry about you not being able to do something that someone else can do because you've been given your own skills, your own, you know, your own functions that you can do. And um, what I'm going to be preaching about this evening is spiritual gifts. And there's, again, this is another subject. There's a lot of misunderstanding about spiritual gifts. You know, we're not a charismatic church. We don't believe the same way that they believe um, about spiritual gifts. It's not a, we're not Pentecostals. We're not, we're not going to be rolling in the aisles and, and you know, jibber jabber coming out of our mouth saying that that's speaking with tongues. But, um, and I'm going to explain a lot of that tonight too regarding these spiritual gifts. But God has given us different gifts through the Spirit of God. When you're saved, you have gifts that God's given you. And as a member of this church, you know, all the members are going to, you know, you're not all going to perform the same function. Just like in your body, there's one nose, right? That nose performs the function of smelling, and that's what it does. Well, there's one pastor in the church, at least in a church this size. You know, as we get to be a bigger body, you know, you might need some more members doing a similar function or the same function. But for right now, we only need one. And there's, uh, you know, there's other things and other skills that we need to have people doing. Now, we all need to be doing the soul winning. That's why soul winning isn't considered a spiritual gift. Okay, this is something that we all need to do. But we're going to look at the spiritual gifts tonight and try to get a good understanding of what they are, what is God talking about. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 really cover this pretty extensively about, about the gifts from the Spirit. But look back in the beginning of the chapter where we started reading here in chapter 12. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's a lot of different types of gifts, but it all comes from one Spirit. He says in verse five, And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So he's saying, you know, there's these different gifts that are given. It all comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes, excuse me, from the same Spirit. It comes from God. But he's giving it different gifts to different people as he will. But the gifts that you're given are there for you to profit, to profit God. That's what he says in verse 7. We'll read it again. But the manifestation of the Spirit, that manifestation, what's been given to you, is given to every man to profit withal. God has given you abilities and skills that maybe no one else in this church has, but you need to make sure that you're not wasting those skills, you're not wasting those gifts, but rather using them to, to profit God, to, to be a, a profitable servant unto God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8 says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. He lists off quite a few things here. Let's, you know, let's, let's, I'm going to briefly go through this without reading the entire chapter. He gives off as gifts wisdom, knowledge, faith, 
healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, um, being able to speak different languages, different tongues, and interpreting tongues. These are all designated as spiritual gifts that are given by the Spirit of God. So, and you can see this. Think about if you've ever been in like a bigger church than, than what we're in today. There are people who are more wise than others in the Bible. You know, that for some reason, a lot of, some people are just really good. And, and oftentimes people who have, you know, a gift of wisdom or gift of knowledge end up desiring to become pastors and teachers because, you know, they've been shown and taught a lot from the Bible and they can see and read the Bible and God just kind of giving them that wisdom. Think about the uh, Solomon, right? God gave him a special gift of wisdom. He's a great example of this, of this spiritual gift that God bestowed upon him where he was more wise than anyone that came before him or came after him. He said, like, like he, God just gave him lots of wisdom. Now, that wasn't all just on Solomon's own, attaining that wisdom on his own. That was a gift given from God. That is definitely a spiritual gift. Now, not everybody has this gift. Not everyone starts off with this gift of wisdom. But it's the same spirit that gives that gift. So the, the, you may have been endowed with that gift of wisdom or with the word of knowledge, he says, or faith. Some people, I mean, they live a life of great faith. I mean, they go through and they're, they are just trusting God with everything. Now, we all ought to be striving to be better in these areas, you know, to, to work on our wisdom, to work on our knowledge, to work on our faith, you know, to be able to, to, to step outside, step out in faith a lot and, and be able to not worry about things. But God has kind of given these spiritual gifts to people where, where it's going to be easier for them to do it, where, where it comes more naturally for them, I guess, if you will. God has endowed them with special gifts, okay? And we need to make sure we're not neglecting the gift that's been given unto us, but that we're rather we use these gifts. And let's see, he says, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Working of miracles. This is a spiritual gift that God is, that the Spirit has administered to people. Healing, miracles. And you think about, you've re re we've read in the Bible about people performing miracles, especially the, the, the apostles who read in the Acts of the Apostles and the miracles that they performed. Now, and again, I'm going to get into this very shortly. There are certain gifts that I don't believe are being administered today. They were administered for a specific purpose. Now, I don't think we should be limiting God. I don't think God is limited. And God is fully capable of performing things, again, and, and, and you know, without being um, limited at all. But I'll get, I'll get into that just a little bit. But I, I want to just make that point real quick because I, I brought up that, you know, there's... You read in the book of Acts, people who had the gifts of healing, just like Jesus did, right? Jesus had the gift of healing. He was able to just heal people. Well, in the Acts, the apostles were able to heal people too. And other people were able to, to have this gift of healing. Working of miracles, right? Similar thing. Uh, and then he says, to another prophecy as preaching, uh, to another discerning of spirits, being able to understand, you know, really being able to read people and read spirits and, and judge what type of, you know, if they're, maybe if they're a phony or a false prophet or not. You know, people are really good at just being able to understand what is this person really saying and what do they believe um, and being able to discern that. It says to another, diverse kinds of tongues, different kinds of tongues. And another word for tongue is language. Some people are very adept at picking up new languages. Other people really, really struggle at it. Right? I mean, some people, I mean, you could be studying and studying all the time, but you never really fully get it. You know, it's a really difficult thing. Just like there's people today, a good way to understand that is just some people are really good at math. Like I'm one of those types of people. I'm really logically minded and just, just math comes real easy to me. I've never really had to struggle with it very much. It's always been something I've just understood. That's a gift that's been given me. But on the other hand, you know, like um, creativity, art, writing, really bad at that stuff. That's just, that's not something that's been given to me. Whereas people, the exact opposite. Some people are just, they're really good at drawing, they're really good at seeing things in a certain way and real artistic. And maybe they're not quite as good as doing the math and stuff and they really struggle in that area. God has given us different gifts. And th these, what we're looking at today, are spiritual gifts. Um, let's jump down to verse number 27. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, Now are ye the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, 
miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So we could, we could, he's saying, you know, covet the best gifts. He's like, you can desire these gifts, and there's no saying that God won't at some point still be able to give you a spiritual gift. You know, Solomon got it later on in his life when he was, when he was going to be a king. God just said, okay, I'm going to give you this gift of wisdom. Who knows how smart he was before that or how wise he was, but God definitely gave him that, that gift of wisdom at that point in his life. We can still go to God and ask for them and try to seek them and, and, um, and you know, ask God for them. Strive for them. But he's saying here, and, we're, and he gets into chapter 13, he'll show you a more excellent way. But I want to point out here, because he puts a, uh, an order of importance on these spiritual gifts. In verse number 20, he says, And God set some in the church, first, apostles. So the apostles are kind of like at the top. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. And then after that, so after the apostles, after the prophets, after the teachers... Then you have people, you know, performing the uh, working miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So, and you look at that, like, diversity of tongues is like at the bottom of the list. Whereas you have the charismatic churches today saying, oh man, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved and all this other stuff. And like, like you need to attain to be able to speak in tongues. If you're speaking in tongues, that means you're really holy. And that's like the bottom of the, of the barrel here of the spiritual gifts. And what they mean by that is something completely different anyways, but we'll get into that. But notice the people, the, the gifts that, that seem to be elevated the most are the ones where people are teaching others, where you're being a prophet, you're being a teacher, you know, the, the apostles, there's no more apostles today, but um, these other things that might look outwardly more attractive, like, man, if I could just work miracles, how cool would that be? If I could, like, just, just heal people, how great would that be? But God puts these other positions, people of teachers and prophets, as, as more important, as a better gift to have, even than being able to heal the sick. That that's more important of a job. It's, it's a better gift to have to be able to do those things than it is to um, be able to speak with tongues or, or to be able to heal, you know, and, and these other things that it says. So I think that's kind of interesting. I'm not going to read through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but chapter 13 describes how, you know, it doesn't matter how many gifts you have. If you don't have charity, then it's meaningless. If you don't have love in your heart to others, you don't, you're not going to profit with all because you're not going to be using it appropriately if you don't have charity in your heart. You, say, you, could, you could have faith to move mountains, but if you have not charity, you say, profiteth me nothing. You could, you could speak with other tongues more than everyone else, but without charity, it doesn't, it's meaningless. It doesn't matter. So, um, and that's where he leads into at the end of verse 12, you know, I show unto you a more excellent way. Um, but let's look at, keep your fingers, he, your finger here. We're going to come back to, well, yeah, we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in a little bit if you want to put a bookmarker there. But turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12, because we're going to see some more references to spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12. Just a few pages back from 1 Corinthians 12, where we were Romans chapter 12. It's near the end of the book of Romans. We're going to start reading in verse number 4. The Bible reads, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Again, he's talking about being part of a body, yet we don't all have the same function. We're not all going to have the same gifts. Verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy 
with cheerfulness. So look at all these different gifts that's been given to us according to the grace of God. And he says, look, if you have these gifts, then use it, which is what we just saw in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. You know, it's, it's to profit with all. If God has given you this gift of prophesying, of preaching, if, if God has given you this, this ability to be able to preach, use it. Get involved in church. Talk to your pastor. Say, look, I really want to learn how to preach. Well, I think, I think God has given me this gift. I have this desire. I want to be able to preach God's word and I want to get better at it. And let's use this and let's, let's, let's refine this gift, that God, this raw material God's given me and really help me to become a better preacher. And, and, you know, and don't silence that gift that's inside of you. Use it for the glory of God. I mean, what a shame it would be for God to have given you a nice, gift, a great gift that you can use for him and you just ignore it, and you just don't do anything about it. That's prophecy. He says, or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering. See, some people are just really good at being able to, to, to focus on the cares of others and being able to help them and, and coming up with ways. Because oftentimes, and I kind of struggle with this, I, always, I have a heart that I want to help people out. I want to minister unto people. But I'm not always good at knowing what a person could use or what they could need. And most people will not come to you for help. Most people will just, just, I'm okay. I'll do it myself. But some people are really good at knowing, you know, this person can use this and they just take it upon themselves and just go help them. And that person will be extremely appreciative of that and will really love them for that and bring them closer, you know, and, and, and you know, make them stronger part of the church or whatever, you'll help strengthen people, edify them by using that gift of ministering where you could just kind of recognize these things. I was talking about this earlier about my mother-in-law. She's not, she's not saved, but she was giving me, you know, she has this real thoughtfulness about her where she gives me gifts because she, she thinks about the things about me personally that affect me and wants to do nice things and, and, and really can focus on that. And that just seems to come to her real naturally. Well, God has given some people this gift of ministry, of being able to minister unto others. So, and, and as we go through these, think about these things individually in your life. Think about what things God might have given you because God has given us all gifts. I firmly believe that. You know, it's not all going to be the same for everybody. Like I just mentioned, I don't think I'm that good. Like I have this gift of ministry, even though I have the heart to want to do it. I'm not very good at recognizing it to just be able to, to pick up on it and just do it. But that is a gift that many people have. Uh, look at what it says in verse, or the, the rest of verse 7, or he that teacheth on teaching. Some people have a very good way of breaking things down and being able to teach and using illustrations and using examples. And hopefully I do have this gift. I feel like I do, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm behind the pulpit and, and have desired to become a preacher because a lot of preaching is teaching. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're trying to break up the Bible and say, look, here's something that maybe you're having a difficulty understanding. Let's break this down. Let's look at this. I'll give you some examples. You know, this is exactly like this. Salvation is just like a free gift. You know, all you got to do is receive it. Those types of things. Hey, if you have that ability to teach, use it. Practice it. Get better at it. You know, um, if you don't use it, you, you know, you're going to lose it. It's not... It's not you may have the gift, but it's going to be real unrefined and not very useful until you can continue to use it over and over again and become even better at it and get your full potential that God has given you. Look at verse number eight. He says, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Hey, some people just know the right things to say to others to help build you up, to help, you know, gain, help you to gain some confidence. You know, when, when you're down, some people just really, I think about uh, Pastor Romero was really good at that. I mean, he, he knew people individually. He really cares about people individually and gets to know them and, and is always has encouraging words and is always, Pastor Jimenez is the same way. I remember going out to visit him. I mean, he's texting me on the way. He's like, hey, brother, I'm praying for you and just, just really has that type of a heart words. It's exhorting. It helps build you up. Some people are really good at that types of things. And if you, if you have, think you have a gift like that, use it. Use it to help others, to edify others, to exhort others in the church. But think about these things. It says, he that giveth. You know, some, God has blessed some people even financially. Just, you know, maybe he's, he's, he's blessed people with a, a certain mind or ability to do a certain job, even just in this world. And God has blessed them and they have some money. Hey, if you're in that position, give it. 
giveth and do it with simplicity. Don't make it all complicated and stuff. Just be able to, oh, yeah, you know what? Here we go, brother. I'll help you out. Whatever. Whatever it may be, being able to give. He says, he that ruleth with diligence. So if you're, if you're someone that, that has a strong character and capable of running things and administering things and ruling things, be diligent about that. And, and use that ability too because it's really, it's really important within the church to have people that are able to run ministries, to be able to run soul winning, to be able to run a service, to be able to run these different things. Song leading. Okay? If you ruleth, do it with diligence. Give a lot of attention to it. To take it seriously and not just, oh yeah, well, whatever. You know, and just being real relaxed about it. Hey, if you're, if you're in charge of something, if you're in ruling something, do it well. God has given people gifts to be able to do that. Uh, it says, He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Not being bitter, not like, not showing mercy unto someone is being real bitter about it, like, oh, no, I'm supposed to just, just, you know, forgive people and stuff, but it, you know, or this person did me wrong, and all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make you pay me back this time, but, you know, he <laughs> said with cheerfulness. Okay, just being happy. I forgave you, brother, what, you know, whatever it may be, where you're showing mercy on someone. And God, these are all gifts that God has given to people. Now, look, they're all things I think we should work at being good at. They're, they're, they're all positive things, and they're, and they're all gifts that we should strive for. He said, covet earnestly the best gifts. Um, we can be working better, but God has given us these different abilities. And f try to figure out what yours is. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, Try to figure out what, what yours is so that you can focus on that a little bit and, and be the best member that you can be. I'm going to look at Ephesians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So the gift of God is God's grace, right? We all have that. God has given unto all of us the gift of eternal life. He says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 9, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Again, talking about different offices, different administrations that, that God has given to different people, these abilities and these gifts to be able to, to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be an evangelist, to be a pastor or a teacher. And this is also, just as a side note, this is a verse I like to show people um, when they're saved. Especially when we go to Solving Europe, I run into quite a few people who are saved, but like maybe they're not in church. And just trying to show people the importance of church, or even if they're just brand new, got saved, trying to show, hey, look, Church is important. Here's one of the reasons why. Because God is given to you pastors. He's given teachers. They're for you. Verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's for the edifying of you. You're part of the body of Christ. You need, you know, you need this. God has given this special gift for you, and you're just forsaking that when you have forsake the assembling of the believers. When you are not going to church, you're totally missing out. Why did you say people say, "Oh, I don't like religion." Well, then why did God specifically give us pastors and teachers? Why did he do it? I don't need to learn from any man. I don't need to go to church. Why did God even create this position of a pastor, of a teacher, of a deacon, of an evangelist? What's the point? The point is for you to show up to church and get edified. The point is for you to show up to church and be perfected, to be made more complete, to be made more perfect in God's eyes. That is the point of it. It is very important. And when you don't come to church, you're missing out on all of that. But anyways, we're talking about spiritual gifts today because he's given some people these abilities to, to, to fulfill these jobs and to fulfill these roles because he's ordained that these roles be fulfilled. And He gives you what you need in order to fill that position. 
God has a position. It's like God's hiring, right? God's hiring pastors. If God wants someone to fill that job, he needs to make sure that people at least have the, the capabilities to fulfill that role. So he endows us with those gifts from the Spirit. Now, not everybody has that gift, but not everyone is qualified. But those that are, we need to try to recognize that and work at that and, and, and refine that so that we can be used and we can fill the positions that God wants filled. Verse number 12, for the, uh, verse number 13, excuse me. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive, but speak Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for who, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, I want to point out this because in most of these verses that were chapters we've already turned to, it makes these reference of being part of the body. Now, we have a very small body here today, but think about, especially as we grow, but even now, think about a body where you're like just completely missing limbs and there's just like a head, like there's no, there's no arms, there's no legs, you're just like this body with like a head. There's no eyes, there's one ear, you know, there's a nose and a mouth. It's, it's going to look deformed, it's not going to look right. And when we have members that aren't utilizing their gifts and not kind of filling in a role and being that a part of a member, whether it be a finger, whether it be, you know, whatever it may be, whatever area you are, we want to have a complete body. We need everybody functioning together. You know, the head can be doing a great job, but if the feet aren't doing their job, you're not going to be able to get around and do as much. Right? The feet could be doing their job, but if the hands aren't doing their job, again, you're not going to be very profitable. You're not going to be doing as much as, as, a, as a fully functioning body can be doing. Just because you are not the pastor does not mean you do not have an important function in this church, in this body. We all have an important function. And what I'm trying to get across today is figure out what your gift is and use it. Don't worry about if you don't have some other gift where you think, well, man, I can't really, I, I, I don't, what I have isn't that good, and I wish I just had this other gift because then I could really do some great things for God. Look, if God hasn't given you that gift, then don't worry about it. Focus on the things He's given you so that you can fill your role. Don't worry about it to be like, well, I don't want to be the ear. I don't want to hear things. I want to be the mouth. I want to do the talking. Well, look, if God hasn't given you that gift, then be the best ear that you can be, you know, and, and fully complete our body that we have here. So, so try to focus in on the things that, that, you know what, I'm pretty good at this. I'm going to try to do this. How can I apply this more towards the church, more towards serving God? What are those things? What, what are some of the things that we've already read? Maybe, maybe it's stuck out to you. And try to take hold of that and embrace that and embrace your role, embrace your function as part of this body. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here because there's a lot of people that are deceived by the charismatic movement of today. And this is where I started off the sermon talking about, you know, they'll, they'll even advertise like they believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And, and they'll just put that out there so that people know that they're these holy rollers, that they're, that they're speaking in tongues and all of this other stuff. That's kind of, they really make emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit, which I'm trying to explain what these gifts are so that you're not deceived by these people who claim to have the gifts of the Spirit when really it's just a circus and a sideshow yeah. and it's not of God, but rather literally of Satan. But there's a lot of people that are deceived by this and I think one of the reasons is because people are looking for physical proof. People are looking for a sign. When it comes to things of God, so many people just, they do like, well, I need some kind of confirmation about this. As we were talking about earlier this morning, you know, um, people are looking for that feeling to be confirmed. Oh, what I'm doing is in the will of God. And oftentimes people are saying, well, I need more to believe in God than just hearing his word. I need more. I need to see something. So when they see these people, 
and they kind of go out of their mind and they're freaking out. They think, wow, maybe that's the power of God. Right? And they see these charlatans and they see the Benny Hins on TV and they're slapping people in their forehead and they're all falling down and going like, wow, that must be the power of God. It's just total deceitfulness. It's not the power of God. That's a power. It is a power. It's a power of Satan for most of these people. But a lot of people are looking for that sign. They're looking for physical proof. And they just won't be convinced without some kind of proof. And that's why I think the charismatic movement gets so many people involved in it anyways. is because it attracts that type of person that, that feels like, well, this must be of God. Because I have that funny feeling. This must be of God because I don't even know what I was doing. And someone told me that I spake all of these prophecies when they so-called speak in tongues. But look at what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 16 Verse number one, because the people that are looking for this type of a sign, the Bible says that's wicked, it's a wicked generation. Verse number one says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Says, oh, you're really from God? Well, show us a sign then. Show us something. Prove it. Prove that you're from heaven. Verse number two, he says, He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And that sign was as, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the belly, so shall the, the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's the sign that was given. So people today who are saying, well, I can't believe until you can show me something. Show me that you have the power of God. You know, uh, basically like remove this mountain or, or do something that shows that, that God's with you. Prove it. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again and came back from the dead after three days. That's the sign that you have. Now you could either accept that or reject it. But don't be looking after any more signs because that's a wicked, adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign. Yet there's so many people today, I think that's why they get sucked in is because they're looking for this confirmation. They're looking for this sign. And they see the sideshow. They see the circus in town at the, the potter's house and at these other places. And that's all it is. is a circus. And they think that that's the power of God when it's really the power of the devil. Now, I'm going to go more in depth on the tongue speaking. Turn, if you would, back to, I hope you had a finger, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14. We spent a little bit of time going through this chapter. The Bible says that this is right after the charity chapter. Remember, we read, we started off reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Chapter 13 is all about charity. And then chapter 14, look at verse number 1. He says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So what's he saying? He's saying, look, you know, desire spiritual gifts, but it's even better just to prophesy. To be able to prophesy, because prophesy, it's preaching, being able to speak like I'm doing today. We all speak English. I'm prophesying in English. I'm preaching. And that's going to edify the people that are here, he's saying, even if you have this gift of being able to speak in unknown tongues, a, a language that maybe you don't know or no one else knows, you're able to, but I'm like today, if I were able to speak in Chinese, if I had this, this spiritual gift like some of the apostles had to be able to just speak with a language that they didn't even learn and be able to speak unto people in their own language, you know, what good is that going to do any of you here? Because nobody knows Chinese. It, and and that's, essentially, that's what he's saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. <clears throat> 
except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? So here he's getting into, you know, he's like, look, I, would, I wish that you could speak with tongues. What is he even talking about when he says speaking with tongues? Keep your finger here. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians 14. Flip over to Acts chapter 2. We're going to get a very solid definition. And if any, you know, Pentecostal comes to you with this speaking in tongues, and again, not someone that you're just going to debate, but someone who's willing to listen and, and be shown the truth and you can have an actual conversation with them, if they're, if they're willing to learn the truth in Acts chapter 2, because they, they tout Acts chapter 2 all day. And they're the ones that'll say, repent and be baptized, Acts 2.30. They're saying, that's what you need to do. We say all this other false nonsense, false gospel nonsense. But if you actually go to Acts chapter 2, which is, which is the day of Pentecost, where, where they get their name from, the Pentecostals, they're real big on this speaking in tongues is what they, they call it. And they think, and literally what they do in the, in the church of people, they have all this music playing and hyping people up and trying to get them into this, this, this pumped up, you know, um, feeling. And really it's very similar to the people in Africa and the tribes in Africa where they're yeah. pounding on their drums and they're running around a fire and they basically go into convulsions too. Okay, it's, it's, it's really no different. It's just been Christianized. It's that same voodoo type of religion where you are being possessed by a devil. And this is what they do. And then they, they you know, all of a sudden you have people kind of rocking back and forth a little bit and go, and they start doing this crazy stuff. And they say that that's of God. And you're, hey, yeah, brother. And they'll be like cheering and clapping because someone's over here and like, you're speaking in tongues. Ah. Nobody has a clue what they're saying because it's gibberish because they're not even speaking a language. Yet they think somehow this is what the Bible is referring to when it's talking about speaking in tongues or speaking with tongues. The Bible doesn't say speaking in tongues. It's speaking with tongues. Let's see if that jibes with what Acts chapter 2 is talking about at the day of Pentecost when the apostles were speaking with other tongues. Look at verse number 3. It says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. That's a literal tongue, right? Like a tongue that's in your mouth. Cloven tongue is a split tongue, like a snake tongue. Like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, this is exactly what we want to look at. These people began to speak with other tongues, and it was from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gave them this utterance. What were they doing? Were they doing what I was just mimicking? Verse number 5. This is all important. None of this stuff is here by accident. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. So first he gives us a little bit of background and saying, look, at this time, at Pentecost, there are Jews from every nation. They're, they're, they're from all over the place. They have come to this point um, you know, to worship God, but they're all here in Jerusalem, in one city, in one place. Verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Look at this, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So here they are speaking with tongues, and they hear them in their own language. So whatever nation they came from under heaven, all of a sudden they hear these people, wait a minute, that guy's speaking Zimbabwe, or that guy's speaking whatever, wherever country they came from. That guy's, that guy's speaking Hungarian. That guy's speaking, you know, and whatever languages were around there in this time, they're, they're here. It's like, how does this guy know my language? But they're hearing the word of God being preached in their own, so there's people there that understand. They're not just speaking this into the air, into a room full of people that only speak one language, and they're speaking some other language. They're speaking this language out where there's people that can understand them. First of all, they're not just speaking it to a group of people and no one can understand what they're saying. They're literally speaking to people that can hear and understand what they're saying. They're amazed by this. They're saying, wait a minute. They're confounded. They're confused. What's going on? We hear every man 
They heard every man speak in their own language. Verse number seven, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying, One another, behold, are not all these which speak Galilee? Aren't these all, people all from Galilee? Aren't they all just from right here? Like, like, how in the world can they speak my language that's on the other side of the world? They're, they're from here. They're Hebrews. I mean, I can understand if they're speaking Greek. I can understand if they're speaking Hebrew. Like, that, that's where they're born. This is what they know. But they're speaking all these other languages. We can understand them. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So there, you see, you see language and tongue being used interchangeably. That word tongue just literally means language, okay? And I don't want to spend any more time on it than that because then he lists off verse number 9, lists off all of the places where these people were from. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and prophetes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So the day of Pentecost, there's people from all over the place, and God gives them this ability to be able to speak to people that, live, that, that speak another language. From Arabia, they were speaking Arabic to these people. Even though they didn't know it, God gave them that gift to be able to speak to them. Why? Because this is the springboard of, of the gospel being spread unto the entire world. There's a major shift in the religion of Christianity, from Judaism to Christianity, which it's the same God, but now instead of everything being centralized around the tabernacle and the temple, and people having to migrate and come to Israel to worship the true God, now he's saying go out and spread it out into the whole world. And this is what I want you to do. So there's this big shift. And in order to, to propagate that, in order to help that become much quicker, you know, to, to, to satisfy that and to um, fulfill that, he's now allowing people that live far away to be able to hear it in their own tongue so they can bring the gospel back to their country and really spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it happened, and that's what happened in Acts chapter 2. It wasn't this church setting, and, and all these believers were just gathered together with themselves and just started speaking different languages just for no reason when everyone could speak the same language anyways. It's stupidity. There's no purpose for that. The purpose is for these other people who couldn't understand what you'd be saying otherwise to be able to hear the Word of God. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Because we, we need to have that foundation as we're reading these chapters. Because Paul is saying, hey, speaking with other tongues is a good thing. And amen, I agree to that. It is a good thing. Just like now the film Marching to Zion is being put, it's, it's in like, what, 60 languages now they're working on getting into all these different languages. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing to, for the people that are able to, that have this gift of being able to speak with other tongues, speak in other languages, because they can propagate great truths and be able to translate and get great messages across into these languages. And there's a lot of teaching and learning that's going to be going on across all these languages. That's the point of being able to speak with other tongues. The point is be able to, so like, when we go out soul winning and we run into these neighborhoods where people only speak Spanish, right? Instead of not being able to get them saved, and you're saying, okay, well, see you later. If you have that gift and if you apply that gift, see, it's not going to come today. We, we, you know, God made this miracle happen where they have these cloven tongues of fire resting upon them and they were able to speak language they didn't even know at all. But God has given some of us a gift just to have the ability to be able to learn languages. And, and you kind of pick it up a lot easier. If you have that gift, you ought to use it and not waste that gift that God has given you because then you can go to these people who can't speak our language and give them an opportunity to get saved because you are utilizing that gift. You are being able to do more to bring glory unto God. It's a perfect way to use a, a gift that God has given you. Let's keep reading here in, in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Um, let's look at verse number 7. I forgot exactly where we were. Verse number 7. And even things without life giving sound 
whether pipe or heart. Well, let's look at verse number six. I don't think we read that. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. These people that are just jibber-jabbering and no one can understand what they're saying, he's saying it's like blowing a trumpet. You think there's, a, there's a specific sound that a trumpet needs to make to sound an alarm. You know, and they use that, especially back then in these times, for different reasons. There is a trumpet call to, to gather an assembly together for one reason. There's another, another different sound that's to, to arm people and get people ready and as an alert, an alarm for war. Right? There's different significance in the sound that's given. And if, and if you don't know what those sounds mean, people are going to be like, oh, I hear a trumpet going off. Like, well, I whatever. I don't know what that means. If you're speaking some language and some words or making some utterance or some sound out of your mouth and people are just like, I have no clue what you're talking about, it does no good. You're speaking into the air. Which again is what these people do that, that claim to, to be, believe and speak in tongues. He says, um, verse 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter uh, by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken for ye shall speak in the air? There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So he's like saying, even me, if, I, if, I, if I'm able to speak in an unknown tongue that I don't even know myself, he's like, what's the point? He's like, my, well, my spirit may be praying to God. But if I don't even understand what I'm saying, my understanding is unfruitful. It's going to do me no good. To, to even do that because I need to understand what it is that I'm praying to God. And he says, what is it then? Verse 15, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So people, because I've heard this before, people are on this, this full spectrum of speaking in tongues, right? This gibberish. Some people will say, oh, well, it's not for the church because you clearly see, again, in this chapter where it's not for believers it was for the unbelievers so why are you doing this in church why are you having this speaking in tongues in church the church is supposed to be assembly of believers and we're going to we'll get to that in a little bit hopefully um where the bible explains tongues are for a sign not to those that believe but to those who believe not those that don't believe just like the people here when they were preaching the gospel they weren't preaching that to these people in other languages um, that were all just these saved people come together. They're, they're preaching this to people who didn't believe so they could look at them and be like, wow. They, 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 I mean, that really, t you take a step back and they're like, I'm going to listen to this person now because they're speaking in my own language. It's not for the general assembly of believers, um, which is like, why do you do it in church? So I've heard some people get that point, but then they say, oh, well, I just speak in tongues at home when I pray. Really? I've heard, I've heard people say that. And um, why are you doing that? I mean, 1 Corinthians 14 says, I'm not going to pray without the understanding. But it's like they want to hold on to this thinking that they're real spiritual because they're speaking in an angelic language that nobody understands. It's like, you don't understand it. Whatever it is you're doing, just making something up or whatever, you don't understand it. Sit down. It's going to do you no good. Um, verse 16 Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? See, he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, sit up. But the other is not edified. 
I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. He's saying it's better just to be able to speak five words that's understood than 10,000. I mean, you can have an entire oration, you know, a two-hour sermon. It's going to do five words is better if people can understand it than just this huge oration that nobody can understand because you're speaking in some unknown tongue that nobody knows. It does no good. Verse 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but understanding be men. In the law is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. This is what I was talking about earlier. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, verse 22, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? And that's exactly what I'm saying about they're crazy. They're mad. They get the whole assembly of the church together and all these people are just shouting out and thinking they're speaking in tongues. No one knows what they're saying. They're speaking gibberish and they're a bunch of fools. It's a circus. That's why I call it a circus. They're crazy. They're mad. Because that is not the place for that at all. And, and again, what they're doing isn't even of God anyways, and it's not real languages. They're just, they're just gibberish. He says, But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. So if someone were to walk in this evening, and, you, and they just see a bunch of people, you know, Brother Rodriguez and, and, and Brother Sebastian over here, and they're just going, oh, and they're just going to be like, whoa, okay, you know, they'll be like, these guys are nuts. I'm getting out of here because that's just weird because it is weird. But if they come in and they hear a man standing up here and preaching the word of God, hey, they can understand that and they're going to be convinced or convicted and hear and be able to understand and get something out of that preaching and at least be able to, 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 um, <laughs> to understand what's being said and not just, just go away because they're like, whoa, you guys are mad. You guys are weird. Um, he says, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most, by three. And that by course, and let one interpret. And again, you go in these churches and say, oh, I'm an interpreter, and I'm, I speak in tongues. You got like, you know, 20 people all speaking in different tongues, and five people saying they're interpreters, and there's this chaos. He's saying, look, if we were to have someone in here that spoke another language, Maybe we saw, maybe there's a guy that we really like and they only speak Spanish, right? But hey, we want to be edified by this man's preaching. He's got something for us to learn and we invited him into the church and he's going to get up and speak. Well, look, we, ought to, we need to have an interpreter, first of all, because there'd be no point, no matter how great the things this guy is saying are or how true they are, if nobody can understand what the guy is saying, there's no point to it. He's not going to edify anybody. But if we had an interpreter so this guy can preach and we can have someone else going, okay, he just said, blah, 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 you know, and, and repeating everything he said in a language we can understand, then there's edifying in that. Then there's something to be said for that. That's useful. But he says it needs to be done in order. And he says, um, Let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be one, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Look at this in verse 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Just one more evidence that these charismatic churches, uh, people that are so-called speaking tongues, are not of God. Because you talk to any one of them, when they, when they go into their fit of, of prophesying, of speaking in other tongue, 
they are not in control. Most of them, they don't even remember what happened. It's like an epileptic seizure. When people go into a seizure and convulse, they black out for that time period. They don't even understand what happened. I mean, you could be like, oh man, you don't remember? I was on top of you and this other guy was there and I was sticking my hand in your mouth trying to get you not to, you know, all this other stuff. And they're like, I don't know. I don't remember any of it. It's the same way with these people who, who claim to you know, speak in tongues where they go into these fits because that's more what they're like. They're like seizures. And what I believe it is, is it's just possession. It's demonic possession. They're being possessed by a devil that's, that's causing them to have this and they are not in the driver's seat. They do not know what they're doing. They're not in control. But if it's of God, the Bible says here that the, the, <clears throat> the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The prophet is in control. The, the spirit is not in control. It's subject. It's underneath the prophet who's actually speaking. Verse number 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Again, it's confusing when you just hear some guy just, just rattling off a bunch of gibberish. It's nonsense. Verse 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. In most of those charismatic churches, they'll have women prophesying and preaching all day long and speaking in tongues and everything else, and that's encouraged. Again, completely against what the scripture says here. Verse 35, And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandment of the Lord. But if any man is be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So my last point, I think that, that completely covers the, the oh, and here's, I mean, my last point on that, with the speaking in tongues, look at who the source is. You don't find this in the churches that are preaching salvation is by grace, through faith, not of works, as any man should boast. You don't find that in these churches. You find that in these Pentecostal charismatic churches that say, you can lose your salvation. Oh, if you backslide, you're not saved. Oh, if you commit a sin, then you're not saved anymore. You need to repent. You need to get right. You need to ask for forgiveness every single day, every single minute, every single hour, just in case you die, because if you didn't ask for forgiveness, then you're going to hell. And all these false gospels. That's the source. Don't believe these fake sources, no matter, no matter how grand their spectacle is. It's a lie. It's a, it's a deceit. So the last point I want to point out here, turn if you would to... Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 4. So last point. Because there are, there are particular gifts that I believe were for the specific time of the apostles that they were given special abilities, special gifts, special powers to be able to do things at that time because especially there being a change in the law somewhat because Christ fulfilled a lot of things. So when there's a change that's happening, you know, God confirmed it with these powers, with these signs that it was just unmistakable. Just like Jesus Christ coming, proving he was the son of God by performing the miracles, healing the dead, I mean, raising the dead, healing the sick, walking out, doing all the things that he did. Like, that's the son of God. Okay. God made it Easy enough to, to be able to identify, yeah, this is after the workings of God, not of Satan like the false teachers would have you believe. This is after the workings of God. And he did the same thing with his apostles going out and teaching. He basically confirmed what they were preaching and what they were teaching as the word of God by using um, these types of special miracles. Stop it. But... Um, Hebrews 2, 3 says, you're, you're in 1 Timothy? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 if you're not. Hebrews 2, 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by, the, by them that heard him? 
God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. So God gave them, was bearing witness of what was being preached through these miracles and through these things that the apostles were doing. <clears throat> but the last point I want to point out is that there's definitely a correlation with the spiritual gifts that we read about that, that I believe are still around today, the prophesying, teaching, exhortation, and some of the other ones that we're reading about as well, with the laying on of the hands. And I believe that pastors ought to be ordained with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, which we're going to see here. Now, I'm going to preach an entire sermon about that because we have people these days that because there's so many apostate churches, they're taking it on themselves to ordain themselves as a pastor and say, I'm going to start this church and I'm going to do this because I know what's right in the Bible and there's all these people are just jokes. And, they're all, and you know what? Maybe there are a lot of churches like that and maybe there is a dearth of the truth, but I still don't believe it's right for someone to just take it upon themselves and just say, I'm just going to start a church. We see all throughout Scripture that you need to be ordained. And I, like I said, I'm going to prepare an entire sermon about that. But just, to, just as a precursor to that sermon, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4 because there are gifts that are received, the gifts of prophecy and stuff are received through the laying on of the hands. And if you don't have someone laying on of the hands and ordaining you and sending you out to start a church, you're not going to have these gifts. Where are you going to get it from? Look at verse number, uh, chapter 4, verse 14 says, he's talking to Timothy, right? His Apostle Paul talking to Timothy. Neglect not that the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He said, you received this gift. Don't neglect this gift. You received this gift with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. When those hands were laid on him, he received that gift. Look at chapter, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Why is the gift of God in you? By the putting on of my hands. Again, to Timothy saying, look, stir up that gift that you received when I put my hands on you and ordained you as a, as a, as a preacher, as a, as a pastor. And I fully, I, I can confirm this and again, I'm not trying to lift myself up in any way, but I've, known, I've noticed within myself since I started pastoring this church, you know, I used to preach some sermons of Faithful Word. I used to run the preaching class and do this. But my preaching has changed. I believe that, that I've received a special gift that was given to me with the laying on of the hands when I was ordained as a pastor. Because back then, I didn't have the same job or the same role or the same function that I had. I had no need for that gift necessarily to be able to do that job because I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't doing these things. But when I was ordained and sent out, according to Scripture, according to the way that God says it ought to be done, I believe God gave me the gifts that I need to be able to fulfill the role that I'm doing today. And that that has been given unto me. And, and I've heard other people say the same thing. Say, you know what, I listened to some of the sermons you preached before, but has something changed after you started pastoring the church? Yeah, it's the gift that's been given through the Holy Spirit. And again, it's not, it has nothing to do with, it, it's, not, it's not my own personal ability or anything like that. It's just a gift that's been received. But we can't neglect those gifts. So think about yourself. Think about the gifts that God has given you. Try to identify those um, so that you can work at them uh, a lot more um, work on improving on those skills and improving on those gifts so that you can be used of God in, in the, the highest capacity possible to serve Him and to be the best member of this church that you can possibly be. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for the gifts that You've given us through the Spirit, dear God. Help us not to help us to embrace the gifts that you've given us and, and to strive to improve on them, dear Lord. Help us to identify these gifts in our life and um, that we would be a complete church and fully functioning in every, in every facet, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you so much. Help us to understand more about the Bible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.